Um, I'm going to speak uh, a bit about a variety of things that I think will be of benefit to you, but I just wanted to reflect for a second before I begin. Um, I was really fortunate this morning uh, because I was late getting here. I, uh, I'm kind of obsessive about getting places really early, um, but I got lucky this morning and I left about an hour and a half in advance. I don't live too far away, but I got to move very slowly through the city. And I know some of you are not from here, but in my city, there are a series of smooth surfaces everywhere that I'm able to easily navigate to get wherever I want to go. And today, there are people out making even more of those smooth surfaces to make my life better. And I'm incredibly fortunate to live in a place where that happens. Um, and to mitigate my uh, only concern, which was I didn't want to cause worry for the organizers of this spectacular event, because it is very well organized, and you're going to hear me talk about why I obsess about organization a bit, and they've done one heck of a job, so I would not want to worry them. But I'm also able to just press a button, and I may, can call in and say, I'm just out here enjoying people making these beautiful flat surfaces. So we are incredibly fortunate. So. Because I had that extra time, I also began to reflect on something that, that is changing in our world that I absolutely love. Um, so let me connect it this way, given that, that Ken has talked about drama. There's a play called Romeo and Juliet you may have heard of. It opens with a 14-line sonnet, and it's a perfectly written poem. It's, uh, this is a masterpiece of, of art, and w when things are done well, you can look at one tiny part, and it contains everything you need. And in Romeo and Juliet, these 14 lines tell the entire story. Everything you need to know and everything that's going to happen in your next two hours of this show are actually in those first 14 lines. And it occurs to me that the new, and in many ways old, uh, but it's new now, tradition of honoring the lands on which we meet is something that contains everything we need to know. It's about, if our politics need a new way of being, perhaps we need to think about treaty. If we need to think about the planet, perhaps we need to remember how lucky we are to be here. If we need to think about how to love better, think about the difficulties that have been experienced by people who would then still be willing to say, let us bring you this honoring of the land to open your meetings and ceremonies, etc." So there are times when we speak about we should do this, but for me, I just think it's extraordinary that we get to acknowledge that. Because I think we're all here because we love the places we are from, and in this place where I am from, which I love, and when people ask me to try and explain, I, I say things like the people and the mountains and all that, but it's a feeling in this place that I love. And I get that same feeling when I hear the honoring of these lands and the people who were here thousands of years before I got that feeling. So anyways, that's what I was thinking when I was on the smooth things, moving slowly. Okay, here we go. Um, now, I apologize, I'm gonna move very quickly. I'm gonna talk to you about performance and the importance of performance and then I'm gonna ignore all of my own instruction because I'm a bit obsessed with sharing with you as much information as possible. That's why my email was at the front, it'll be at the back because if you have questions or you wanna follow up, I am absolutely happy to do so. But I really believe in the work you're doing, and so I want to pound you with information that I think will be relevant. So apologies in advance. So here's, uh, I like to begin with gratitude, and I, so I always think of where I'm from and, and the magnificence of it, so I am grateful to be here. Okay, so before we begin, I'm gonna give you something that's gonna show up later in what I'm doing and just see if you can consider it so you've got some advanced warning on an exercise I'm going to give you. I'm going to do a lot of talky talk and then I'm going to give you some bold experiments. Now these are actually things to do and I promise you they work. So it's just you trying them out to see, okay? And it's going to be a thing called the face that I'm going to finish with. And so what I want you to do is, uh, because I'm going to be pretty boring, uh, when you start to drift off, just start to work on this exercise, which is I want you to think of a face, someone in your life, um, who looks at you with joy. Um, now, the trick here is don't think of a romantic partner or a parent or something like that because they look at you with love, but there's stuff involved with that. Um, and don't think of like a spiritual leader because they love you, but there's stuff involved with that. 
For me, I always think of my grandmother, but I, I hate using that example in case you had a mean grandmother and it makes you go in the wrong direction. Um, it could also be a puppy. The face is that, like last week, you um, crashed your vehicle into uh, a historical monument and destroyed it, um, or just won the Nobel Prize. That face still loves you just as much, no matter what. So it might also be a puppy. I know that there are probably cat people here. I don't know that cats look that same way as puppies. But it's just a face where no matter what happens, when you encounter it, it hits you with that, that feeling. Okay? So if you could just think about that as you're going along, that would be great. If you don't have a face like that in your life, and that is something that arises, I apologize on behalf of the universe. That is not right. Um, I assure you there are faces out there. Mine is one of them. Unfortunately, my face looks like this. So you don't want to be picturing my face. Um, but sometimes you can think of, say, the sun or the moon. It's just something that, again, the sun will warm you and the sun rises and it's a good thing at all times, unless you're not a sun person, then it's like the moon, same thing. But you're not thinking of like a famous person or anything like that. So just work on that as we go. All right, so here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about some hard truths. I'm going to give you a warning and talk a bit about myself and there's a reason why. Um, I'm then going to talk about performance technology. I'm then going to talk about reality. And then I'm going to talk about bold experiments. Boom. Some hard truths. You are noble people doing important work. And that's why I'm here. It's the only reason why I'm here. Because I literally believe in what you're doing, and I literally believe that you are noble people. And so this is something that I try to discuss when I speak to people like you, um, and I'm never going to succeed doing that. You're not going to believe me. And that's a central problem. Okay, I can explain why I'm right on this, but I am right that you are noble and that you are doing important work, but I'm also right and it breaks my heart that you won't believe me. If I came in and I told you you're dreadful, you're not working hard enough, you're letting us all down, you would immediately believe that. But no matter how hard I work, you will not believe the truth. That's a hard truth. Okay, I like to mention the notion of being avuncular. I try to do this at the beginning of every talk I give. A good friend of mine helped me with this. I'm going to get really passionate about the stuff that I'm talking about, and you're going to feel like, man, he really believes this. So I want to remind you that the reason I speak about this is this is what I study. I obsessively study performance. How do you do things in your life better? Okay? I'm not... It's not productivity for me, this is everything. And so I have obsessively studied this my entire life, so I'm gonna sound very confident. It, but this is in the things that I have studied. I do not live my life this way. I, like you, attempt to do things that are good, etc. But if at any point it seems like I'm trying to say, like, this is how I live my life and you should be more like me, it is not. For whatever reason, I only learn through making horrific mistakes. I cannot learn in any other way. So I am like the, the sort of least together person you will ever encounter. Um, but when I start to tell you this stuff, it's going to sound a bit avuncular. And so just be aware of that, OK? It's a, a good warning, because I don't think the bold experiment thing would be, hello, I'm a middle-aged white guy here to tell you how to live your life. Um, I, know, I know we don't have nearly enough of that. Um, <laughs> So here's, uh, I work on performance technology. This is, uh, I love this image, not because it's me, but because this is what my university put together in their promotions package to promote faculty on their campus. They picked me for one of the people they wanted to promote, and they, they I guess, assumed that this is what I do. I showed up for the photo shoot. They, they have a huge number of people there, and they have a sword and stuff, and I'm just standing. So I have no idea. I don't know if the sword is the performance or the technology. I don't really know. Um, but it, in case it's you know, received strange, you know, this performance technology thing that I do, even the people that pay me don't really have any idea what this is. Okay, so performance technology, let me walk you through what it is. So performance plus technology seems to be the thing. It's actually, I think, all the same thing. It's really an, an equal sign, but I have to add the expression and you'll see why. I'm going to walk you through this because this is how I'm going to speak about the other parts. Okay, so technology. Techne. Everything is techne. All you need to think about in life is techne. And it's an ancient consideration. It's been around all the way through, and techne is everything. And if you think of everything as techne, your life will be better. Here's why. So everything is technology. Technology is everything. 
if you think of everything as technology, everything gets simpler in your life. Okay? Here's why. Techne becomes technology, becomes technical, becomes technique, becomes information technology. No, I'm not going to go that fast. I'm going to slow back down. I want to walk us through what these things are. Okay? So techne, oh, here, before I go to Usain, let me give you the one little thing. Techne is a conversation that began in ancient Greece. Now, it was a conversation that was happening throughout the world that was connected by trade routes at that time. And what techne was is how you do, what you do, when you do, what you do. And so they were discussing what is techne, how do you develop techne. It's how you find what it is that you can do in the world, the work that you then do to honor that, and the goal is for you to give to society. How do you identify what it is you can do? What is the work you need to do to then do that work? And the reason you are doing it is because that's how you give to society. That's techne. That's where the word begins. Okay? So we get all of these different types of analyses of different approaches to things. So Usain Bolt is one I think of. Usain Bolt does not run properly. His gait is incorrect. But he's the best ever. One of the things that we want to remember when we think about how we do, what we do, when we do, what we do, is that the right way is just someone's formula or way of describing something. And that true excellence is about you finding your way of being you. Right? It is not a cliche to say that you are the only one of you around. You literally are the only one of you around. So that body you've got and that experience you've got is unique. And so mastery of that is everything. Techne is everything. So technology, where does this come from? We think of it in different ways now. Basically what happens is around about the Renaissance, so the last time, uh, when I say Renaissance, the commonly referred to Renaissance being sort of 16th century uh, inside in England, a little bit earlier around Europe, uh, what happens is techne, which is how we do everything, right? That's what, they that's what the conversation was from, you know, thousands of years before. All of a sudden, they say, well, we've got this new technology, and it's about words. It's called the printing press. Uh, words uh, is logos. And so they talked about, well, now it's techne logos, technology. This is the way we do what we do, the way we structure knowledge. That's where the word comes from. Okay, so then technical at the exact same time, oh, I did that thing where you get the bump in the microphone. Ken Cameron wouldn't do that. At exactly the same time, there's a scientific revolution, and the word technical comes up, and it's to describe the scientific or mathematic or rational connection with techne, living a life based on those structures. Technique. So technique then becomes what we talk about in a more personalized sense, because we started to use techne, which is supposed to be how we live our lives, as techne logo, so as technology, and then technical in terms of reason, but people that really were still focused on personal performance talked about technique then. They said, well, we still need the same word. We'll talk about technique. So the dancer has technique. The athlete has technique. The carpenter has technique. People that are actually doing these things, they have technique. And my favorite example of that is Yo-Yo Ma and Pablo Casal. So Yo-Yo Ma, I'm sure you've heard of, um, a master musician, someone who has technique. Well, Pablo Casals was the greatest cellist at the time that Yo-Yo Ma was growing up. And Yo-Yo Ma was so good that everyone was hearing about him when he was a child. He was a prodigy, but he really was coming along. Now, Casals was famous not only for being the best cellist, but for being a master of technique. It's what he was known for. And so people wanted to go and meet Casals. People wanted to learn from him, but he was a ruthless teacher. He made people weep because they did not approach technique properly. He met with Yo-Yo Ma, listened to him play, and Ma is like nine years old at this time, and Casal's advice to him was, for your technique, what you need to do is play more baseball. Because his technique was already perfect, and too much more work would ruin it. What he needed to do was work on himself to be alive, because the techne is about the whole person. 
And this is an incredibly important note, I think, because in each of these areas, what it really is, is it's still just about techne. So if you begin to think of everything as technology, it allows you to stop making distinctions that aren't really necessary to make and just saves time. So then we get to our age, information technology, when we're now sort of so completely corrupting the term that we're adding whole extra words. And in so many ways, right, we're, these are redundancies. Remember where techne came from, information, it's come on, it's, it's already in the word. So our moment, the great moment here, is this ugly little letter on the side. I think that this may be the most important publication in the last hundred years. It's Bill Gates' letter to the homebrew club. And in it, what he is saying is that information is now capital. Information is now property. Information is now the central organizing structure of the way we do trade, et cetera. Seems like a minor observation. Now, of course, everyone talks about this. Jack Ma says information is gold, et cetera. But when you think about what that means when we hear people arguing about uh, capital and capitalism and this and that and the other thing, they tend still to be referring to industrial capital, as opposed to the fact that now capital, which was supposed to be these very hard goods, is ephemeral. It's information. That's a massive transformation. Okay? So performance then. If I'm talking about technology, I think you can get how that would connect to performance, but let me emphasize why the performance component. It's because of aesthetics. Aesthetics should be first philosophy. Nothing is more important than aesthetics. Nothing is more important than aesthetics. It's the study of what is beautiful, and we don't really talk about that much anymore, and that's a mistake, because it's the most important thing to talk about. So, performance is what you do, when you do, what you do, plus how you do, what you do, when you do, what you do. I love saying that stuff. It makes perfect sense, but I slowed it down there and even did the clicking through of the slides so I wouldn't lose you. That's technology. How you do, what you do, when you do, what you do. That's technology. It's how you do what you do. And so if you study that system, regardless of where your body ends and the phone begins or the team or the city, and you just look at it all as a system of how things are being done, right? And what is being done and in what ways, it makes things very simple. Okay, you are what you repeatedly do. I know what you were saying. You're saying all of this, this discussion of sort of ancient Greek philosophy has me thinking of Aristotle's, you are what you repeatedly do. To me, this is the most important sentence that's ever been written down or spoken. And it's only part of the sentence. There's a second half. You can get this, by the way, in about 50 million memes online, often attributed to sort of, you know, Justin Bieber or somebody else like that. Um, the second part talks about excellence and what you need for excellence. You don't need any of that. All you need to know is you are what you repeatedly do. This is the most powerful phrase and most powerful concept ever introduced. And let me tell you why after I go for a drink of water. That's the other thing. I was thinking about the smooth roads. So in my neighborhood, the water stopped one day, okay? So before I know the water stops, there are trucks out front of my house filled with water with signs saying, sorry, your water is not working. Here is a thing full of water. So I go out to get water and people are like, oh, water. I'm like, but like, isn't water magically coming out of the walls of our house? And then today it's not. And before we know that, there's a thing in front of our house full of water saying, sorry, the water isn't magically coming out of your walls. It will be again shortly. How in the hell are we not like doing a dance of like, how lucky are we? You are what you repeatedly do. This is, by the way, is why aesthetic is important. We take for granted that which is most important. And so we need to focus on it because that's what strengthens it. Because we take for granted things that we have all the time. And we can very easily say, let us cut things and cut away and break things down because we have forgotten how lucky we are. And we have forgotten how much we rely on various people out there doing this magical work which to us is magical and to them is incredibly difficult. So 
you are what you repeatedly do. So if we're all working on uh, Spanish, right? We do a bit of that every day, we become better at Spanish. We're all working on softball, we do a bit of that every day, we get better at that. Some get a little bit better, some get you know, quite a bit be better, some are amazing, right? So that's fine, we know that, it's a behavioral type of a process and we tend to focus on that component of it. This is the bigger one. What happens is if you accept less for yourself or if you work in a way where you are unhappy, you're not missing out on doing your best. You're developing a practice of accepting mediocrity and allowing yourself to be lesser than. Those are also muscles. So if you decide to no longer do that, you're not starting from zero. You're starting from a deeply ingrained muscular practice of accepting less. That's terrifying, and it's why you want to bring some attention to technology. How are we doing what we're doing when we're doing what we're doing? Because attention to that can change everything, and the way to do that is to look at everything as technology. Okay, so it's just techne. The oldest concept around, and if you're thinking, oh, but that's like Plato and Aristotle, that's like just Western civilization, there is no doubt there was separation between the populations in the Americas in those conversations, but the conversation around techne was part of every culture throughout Asia, et cetera. It's in all of the ancient texts, and the debates were happening between all of those groups. Techne happens to be the one that comes up through the English language, so I use it because I am speaking to you in English in case you hadn't noticed. Um, but that conversation is ancient. How we do what we do, when we do what we do. How do we live good lives? Okay, here are my bold experiments. I've brought you seven. Okay, they're the experiment, they're Serena, gratitude, name, story, beauty, face. Here we go, experiment. So the trick with bold experiments is I love that. This is a great concept and you're doing everything right. This blew my mind. So I, I mean, I've spent a lot of hours talking to the organizers of this event, which is awfully nice for me because I like lots of information, but it, must, it took up a lot of their time. But it's very well structured. One of the things that I see that is really difficult is everyone knows we have to make some changes but you'll talk about that inside of the same old structure, that's not gonna work. And I would suggest to you that the way your event is structured actually mirrors what you need to be doing, which is working in primary literacy, which is a networked literacy as opposed to a book-based literacy. I love books. It is not our primary literacy anymore. We live in a new way. And the way that this is organized is reflective of that new way. So that's a good thing. It might be uncomfortable if you're not familiar with it, but it is the new way, so that's helpful. So, but with bold experiments, I don't think you want to be thinking of like bold as in like over the top, wild and all that kind of stuff. What I will tell you from performance work is this, work easier, work easier. Find ways to do things with elegance. Find ways to do things with less effort. Find ways to do things that feel good. We are so trained to try and work so hard that it hurts even though it doesn't increase productivity, that it is hard for us to do this. But if you think of technique, if you think of mastery, work easier. Every time you're looking at something, say, how can I make this easier? I've got a young son, he's sick today, so I'm a little bit worried, but uh, yeah, he's really interested in martial arts right now, as kind of little kids would be. And kids, when they're interested in martial arts, he does this when he's punching, he's going like this, like because he's trying to play being a great martial artist. But you look at Bruce Lee, he's fluid work easier. So the obsession with experiments should be low expectations. You want to start exercising? Start with 30 seconds a day. You want to do a new program? Start with something small that will almost guarantee success because then what you've got is a success practice and something people can see as having worked. You spend too much time on that massive project that has to have everything go right just to be implemented it's too big, you can't get it through, you can't get the people to understand, it's too hard to explain to them, just do something small, right? So the boldness is gentle is the new bold, okay? Serena, this is one of the biggest problems in the world um, and I think it's a problem that you have. Again, the middle-aged white guy, doing, I, I did say the avuncular thing, this, this is what's wrong with your life. We often hear people saying, what do we need to do to be better? And you'll get surveys. What do we need to do to be better? That's what we ask ourselves when we are beginning any type of a journey, when we are developing our practice in our craft. 
But what do you do if you're already doing a good job? If you're already doing a good job and you say, let me keep getting better, you may get worse. In fact, you almost certainly will. So getting to the top of the mountain is hard. It is much harder to stay at the top of the mountain. And so Serena, uh, Serena Williams, if you don't know, um, is the greatest in her field, and like of all time, and by a long shot. And she's been greatest for a long time. And so what I would suggest is consider whether you're in a Serena moment, which is, what if everything is going really well, and the way you need to be asking questions is, how do we stay on top of the mountain? Because if you're on top of the mountain and you keep pushing, I guarantee you, you're going to fall off the other side. Casal said to Yo-Yo Ma, your practice needs baseball. And Yo-Yo Ma got better. So I'm not saying maybe that you're all in absolute perfection right now. Probably most of you just, you know, but just remember that maybe in a team scenario and maybe in, in areas where you're working, you might actually already be doing amazing work. And it might be pathological to say, how can we improve? Particularly if you're using surveys from people who have no freaking clue and don't really get the fact that magic is coming, you know, water is coming magically out of the walls. In the data age, we can end up being punished by information that can take us off track and be less productive. So sometimes you're already doing a great job and harder work will make it worse. I know it's counterintuitive. We want to suffer as I should work harder. It's, you know, yes, it seems good, but I'm happy and my relationships are all good. So I'm clearly not giving enough to this. Gratitude. Gratitude practice works. Do gratitude practice. Thank people. And I want to give you some specifics on this. You've heard that being grateful in your life will work. I mean, the evidence on this is just incontrovertible. So wake up, be grateful for three things, try to be grateful for three things at the end of the day. It will improve your cognition, it will improve your health. Full stop, there's just no question there. The evidence is massive. That's not what I'm talking about. This is a work-related thing and you people are doing work that is incredibly important. See if you run into the problem that I run into, which is you become so busy you're no longer saying thank you to the people who have done great work. You're rushing from meeting to meeting, and you're going past a person who you normally would stop and be able to talk to and say, hey, thanks for that thing that you did on that project we did, but you no longer have time. So you're getting a lot done, and everything seems good on paper, but if you're working at such a pace that you've lost the time for the thank you card, that you've lost the time for the acknowledgement, you're not strengthening the good things that were making the stuff possible. And that's a warning sign. And working on thanking people is incredibly important. You will develop a gratitude practice. You'll get better at thanking people. It doesn't have to be nine hours of stuff, but if you're working on being genuinely grateful for the work people around you do, they're gonna feel it because you've got a stronger gratitude practice. Yes? We've all worked for other people, right? And we know what it's like when someone acknowledges what we've done. We work flat out on a project and you know, just use every bit of our energy for months on end. And a small, genuine thank you is what everybody's looking for, right? They're not looking for the bigger paycheck. We'll take that, it's just lower down the list. They want the actual acknowledgement. That's a note, it's a feedback loop from somebody in their tech name. I want you to work on a name practice. This is super simple. Um, here's what you do. You say hello, then you say my name is, then you give your first name and last name. Can we do this together right now, please? Yep, you ready? You're gonna say hello, then you're gonna say my name is, and then you're gonna say your first name and then your last name. One, two, three, go. Hello, my name is Patrick Finn. See how much louder I was? I mean, come on. We don't do any name practice. You say hello, by the way, because what happens is when you're first speaking to someone, their ear needs to tune to your voice. Have you ever sort of watched a film or some kind of a show or something like that, and maybe the person has like a Scottish accent or whatever it is, they begin speaking and you're like, you can't understand anything they're saying, and like nine seconds later, you're fine. Your ear needed to tune to their voice. When you're meeting someone, Say hello because it's a longer word with a big O ending which tunes their ear to your voice. Then say, my name is, because you're creating a contract. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to deliver my name. Then say your name and push the last name. 
So you don't go, hello, my name is Patrick Finn, which we all do, right? It is a, it is a long-standing Canadian tradition to be apologetic about our names, and we're meeting each other, and everyone is saying, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you, and you're having to re-say your name like three different times. How is it possible that we haven't got saying our name down yet? It's because we're not doing it as a practice. Now, why does this matter? Because we judge people very quickly early on. And if what you're saying is, hello, my name is Patrick Finn, and I drop that ending, what we know is you now feel that I am insecure. You won't trust me as much. I'm doubtful of myself. And I'm not saying this because you want to be whatever, commanders of uh, the room or something like that. It's that you're going to be representing ideas that really matter, which means stick the ending. You, almost all of you have a better name for this than I do, right? Like Ken Cameron. That's great. An O and an N, right? I've got Finn. It's, like, it's, like, it's hard to push that ending. So I'm fighting an uphill battle my whole life. Make sure to hit that ending of your name hard because it sends the message, it ends the information offering, and it sends the message clearly to the person. Practice your name. Story. Story is the most powerful form of information technology ever devised. I can give you a tiny amount of information. You will remember it for the rest of your life. You, it will be so complex that you're able to add new understandings of it throughout your life. You can pass it to someone else. It is so powerful and has so much integrity that they can then share it, adding new nuance relevant to their experience, and it can last. Story is more important than anything else. Programmers use story to write code more efficiently. Story is everything. So become aware of what is your story. Do you have a five-sentence story about who you are? What is the story of the project you're working on? What is the story of the person that you're engaging with? Story is the operating system of the human mind. Now, everyone is not just one story, but it's good to know if the person running your project is living a tragedy right now rather than a comedy. Because they are living in a story, not because it's fictional, but because that's the operating system for our minds. Story is how we store information. You need closings, you need buttons, you need to attend to that stuff. So when people are worrying about visions and strategic plan and all of that stuff, it's because that's the most important information technology there is. Story is everything. Beauty practice. I went fast through story because I wanted to get this one. Start every meeting with beauty practice. We do not have enough beauty practice. We at the university have been failing you for years. We got out of the beauty business and got into the whiny, complainy business, right? Like there's just, no one saying, man, if we could get one more critical essay about the tyranny of the whatever, right? Like, we are full up, and we don't have any discussion of beauty anymore. And the thing is, we need that. We need to see, look at what works well, and then explain why it works well. The last place that I see this now, because we don't really have reviewing of art anymore, there's a different reason for that that I won't go into, but what, what is color commentary in sports? So what happens is you're watching a sport, and you're, I mean, you're watching it, so you're probably enjoying it, but there's what's called a color commentator, and that's a person who's played the sport before who understands it really well. They know the technique. And so what they do is they say, what you really want to notice about you know, Usain Bolt or Serena Williams is, watch how he, she does this. And then they zoom in. They're helping you understand excellence. They're helping you understand the beauty of it. You get more out of it, you can learn from it, and it feels more beautiful. Now, beauty practice, doing this over and over again, means you will get better at beauty practice. And when I say beauty, I'm not talking about art, because for me, I, I believe art is more important than anything else, but I don't believe that everything inside of the world called art is art. There is computer code that I have seen that is beautiful, absolutely beautiful and we should be talking about that. The structuring of this conference is beautiful. All the different elements, when I look, it's like, oh, you, you paid attention to this, and it's the same way you paid attention to that. Beauty is something we need to notice and describe because it helps people understand that it's there and remember it. It's beautiful that someone knew to get a big tank of water out front of my house when there was no water, and a sign that even said, sorry, okay? But the thing is, we take for granted the best things in life. 
And the reason we take them for granted is no one's talking about them. So develop a beauty practice. When I say this in terms of starting a meeting, if your team is working on a particular project and you all have the chance to do this now, you're going to see beauty in other people's work. It's like, oh, this is what they did in that city, and this is what they did in that municipality, and it's, that's beautiful. And why is it beautiful? Is it beautiful because of project management, because of the team, because of the It is beautiful for a variety of reasons, and you can see the beauty in the area that you know. So see beauty, describe it, and when you begin a meeting, instead of going right to the problems or the bureaucratic whatever, start with a conversation of something beautiful from the realm in which you are working. It'll set the tone, it'll inspire you, and remind you to focus on the important parts. It's one of the reasons to get together and share success with each other. It's one of the reasons to do bold experiments. Create beauty that others can learn from. You can never explain to people, believe me, I'm trying to explain to you now and know that I'm failing, you can never explain to people what they really need to know. What you need to do is show them, right? Show them. Do the experiment and show them. Okay, the face. We're back to this now. This is one that I've been implementing recently uh, that is normally uh, part of something that is kind of reserved for deep down into acting type work. Uh, and I'm bringing this to you because of the times we're in. It's called the face. So this is from a tradition that's called method acting. I've done a lot of method acting. It's, there's different ways to study acting. Uh, method was one that appealed to me. Uh, method uses basically uh, attention to emotional stuff um, and gets good at loading it and unloading it, so changing states. In my performance work, because uh, as I say, I obsess on performance, so I work with all different types of groups, individuals, uh, teams, et cetera, trying to analyze their performance and then make it better. Um, and I have like a 100% success rate. And the reason for that is I just share all the current research and look at what they're doing and we do some experiments and then it works, right? It blows my mind that other people aren't as aware of this, but I just want to say that this type of stuff is 100% effective. And I have nothing to do with that. It's all just having the time to bring some attention to the beauty in your work. Okay, but here's the face. The face is because recently I have become concerned that good people, good people tend to be sensitive people, good people are being Good people are suffering because maybe there's a lot of negative information and et cetera in the world. And so the face is designed to address that. So the face concept, the exercise basically, is that what you're trying to do is you're trying to think of this face. So if we can do this now, it'll be quick. You might not get this right away, but I want you to sort of go through it a bit. Um, some of you are going to get this very quickly, others it will take time. This works, believe me, okay? Um, the deal is you're going to close your eyes. Now, some people are not comfortable closing their eyes in a crowd. Um, that's totally fine. Do the thing where you close your eyes all the way where like your eyelashes are touching so you can still see stuff, but you're not, you know. So do that and see if you can see that face. And the exercise is this. See the face. Picture it. I can see many of you still looking at me. You, no, don't see my face. See the face. See the face. Picture it and just see the details of it. It is not an active scene. They're not saying hello to you, anything like that. Just see that face that smiles at you, that is that sort of just nice, welcoming love that isn't, again, that romantic-y thing that has all kinds of other energy attendant upon it. Just see that face. And go through the detail, the sort of color of the eyebrows, what the hair is, et cetera. And that's it. And when you're, when you're through the details, you can see the details again. Just run through it. And then just stop now. It's just sort of like a mindfulness thing. If you've heard of mindfulness, right, where you get distracted, you come back to the breath, you're going to come back to this face. Now, what I don't have time to be asking individual questions right now, but what I'm assuming is that for some of you, thinking of that face makes you feel better pretty much instantly. And this is basically the trick of method acting, which is that we have all of these emotions already in us, and we can load them anytime we want. Well, the face is a way for you to feel not just neutral, but kind of leaning into positive. In method, we work pretty hard getting to neutral. I'm a little bit concerned that people right now need to get lean into positive just a little more than neutral because of the current conditions of the world. Or are you giving me numbered signs about my time? See, they're so damn good at this. I love that. Thank you. Um, and, I, and I am just done to it. It's like everything is just beautiful. So if it's a puppy, if it's the sun hitting your face, if it's that face. Now, here's the way to do this. Do this exercise kind of when you're on, like doing it for the first time in this surrounding is not easy. 
So do this when you're on your own and commit a huge amount of time to it, like 30 seconds. And then do it again for 30 seconds the next day. And try it out a few times like that and see if it doesn't make you feel better. Because if it does, now you have proof that I can do this thing that makes me feel better. Over time, then, try it when you're like walking through the mall. See if you can see the face even though you're out in public. Do this practice. You don't need to do it a lot. But just do this practice. And if you can do it as regularly as you can, you will strengthen your ability to do this. Now, what that means is if you find yourself in a situation where you are frantic or feeling um, jagged or whatever it is, or somebody in an immediate moment is upsetting you, you can run this program and bring yourself back out of it. And it works every time, okay? And so what people will do inside of method work is we do an exercise like this. We do it before we work because then we can work. And then we do it when we're done working because it restores us and we're not having to deal with the effects of the day afterwards because actors are trying to shift states repeatedly and do it healthily. And if you can shift states, then you can be more efficient. But if you can get out of it deliberately so that you can return to this place, then you can do it well over time. Because my concern, why I've started putting this into all my work, is that all of the people that I'm working with on performance stuff, and I only like to work with, like I'm not working with people that are like trying to kill people, right? It's like you, I want to work with people that are trying to make the world a better place. We need you. You're doing work that we really need. And I'm worried that people who care and that dedicate their lives to good things are being upset by the conditions of the world because, oh my goodness, the conditions of the world. But what is going to save us in this time of great transformation is the work that you are doing. Everything in our society will change because of the technological revolution in which we are in. And the change will continue and it will speed up. And what we know from the last time we had a technological change like this is everything will be ripped apart. Right? The last time this happened, the church, which was one church and everything, it was politics, church, everything, it got ripped apart. Everything will be changed. Everything will be transformed. What will be left are the new experiments that draw from what we know of the past but are addressing the present. Those will be the new structures. It's not going to all go to ashes. Well, it actually might, so keep doing that face exercise. It's going to change, and you're changing it. Because it's not going to be the politicians, because they're not necessarily disputing one another right now. Sorry, all of our politicians here are wonderful. I mean the other ones. The left and the right absolutely agree on everything right now for the first time ever. They agree that everything is terrible and that we need to rip everything down and that they have the solution. And they're caught in a kind of a transformation too. They're doing their best, don't get me wrong. But we've got to be careful that we don't rip away wonderful components of our society and that we have ways of working better together, that we have ways of living in treaty, that we have ways of acknowledging the land, that we have ways of living in love because love is really the central component of our lives. That's our techne. And that's my time and thank you very much. Boop, boop.